to a loud explosive Big Bang in today's show. Which is totally dedicated to your delectation and pleasure. May, May we, we present, present a homemade hologram. May we also present a strange but true story of a bright spark called Charles Wheatstone, who helped to catch a Victorian murderer. <laughs> and we'll also be answering some fairly tricky questions concerning heaps of feathers and lumps of lead. Will there be a big bang or a big splat? But first, a, a trick. trick. Can you stand that egg on its end, Gareth? You want to smash that egg on my head, don't you? Would I do a thing like that? Well, you did do a thing like that. Look at this. Photograph of the first ever episode of The Big Bang, and there it is, smashed egg on my head, thanks to you. Gareth, I promise this year, no egg on head. OK, go on, do the trick. OK, balance an egg on its end. <laughs> now, let me try again. No. You haven't got it, have you? Let me give you a clue. A bit of the old lickety spit, right? <laughs> yeah. Now it'll stand on its end, I suppose, eh? Hup. No, it won't work. Yes! You must have thicker spit than me, that's what I reckon. <laughs> well, I've going? actually got an extra added ingredient. I've been using salt, right? Uh, I made a yeah. ring of salt, and then after I licked the egg... <laughs> but you can't I do dipped again. it into the salt, and because the egg's wet, the salt sticks to it, and it's that ring of salt that makes the pointy egg end into a flat egg end and it stands up. Go on, do it, do it. Oh, I said you can do it twice. All right, here's an egg trick for you. Can you remove the shell from this raw, uncooked egg full of runny yolk without damaging the inside? Want to know how it's done? I shall show you later on. strange but true story is about a riddle which had people puzzled for hundreds of years. If I want to send an urgent message to someone who lives hundreds of miles away, how can I do it without having to shout very loudly? There were ways of sending messages over great distances. Either you needed something that could be heard over that distance, like blowing a whistle, <whistles> or something that could be seen from a long way away, like waving a flag. Some people thought there might be another way of sending messages, and in 1558, an Italian philosopher by the name of Porter wrote a... Carry your bags, missus. Oh, no, Gareth Porter with an A. Oh, sorry. Anyway, this chap, he wrote a book called Natural Magic, in which he said there might be a way of talking to people hundreds of miles away using a mysterious power. Yes, I know the 1307's supposed to go at 1307. This power could be produced to... using only a piece of amber and some fur. Now, when you rub the fur onto the amber, you get what we now know is static electricity. And that static charge can affect the way a compass needle moves. So you can get it to point in different directions. Now, Porter thought if you could get this mysterious power to work over long distances, then you could move a compass needle hundreds of miles away. And you could get it to point to different letters of the alphabet and you could spell out your message. 
Incredibly, he was right, but it took 300 years to come up with a way of sending electricity over long distances. The first telegraph machine using electric wires was installed in Paddington Station in 1839. This is a Big Bang version of the machine. It's a board with the letters of the alphabet on it. A, B, D. You can see that some of the letters are missing, but that still means I can send perfectly good messages. Also on the board, there are five switches. And this is how you choose the letters to send. To send an H, all you do is follow the black lines from that letter to the appropriate switches and line them up. And that's how you send an H. Now on the bottom side of the board, say I wanted to send an O, follow the black lines and line the switches up the other way. Now Gareth flicks the switches at his end and that makes these needles here change direction. So all I have to do is see where they're pointing and read off the letter. OK then, go ahead. Right, that one's pointing that way, that one's pointing that way, L. Right, that one's pointing up that way, that one up this way, that makes an I. And then, oh, this up here, that one pointing that way, K. E. Like. T. H. H. The, right, like the, F, uh, uh, R, O, K. Fro, frock? With a K, that's not how you spell frock. Of course, there isn't a C. Thank you very much, I like it too. Everyone thought the telegraph was clever, but they didn't think it would really catch on. Then, in 1842, there was a murder. A chap called John Towell killed a woman in Slough. He thought he'd escaped because he made his getaway on the fastest thing around at the time, the train to London. But he hadn't allowed for the new telegraph machine. The telegraph wires now ran as far as Slough Station, so the police sent a message down the line, so to speak, to Paddington Station. They sent a brief description of towels. It only took a couple of minutes, and when he got off the train, he was arrested. Everybody now knew about the telegraph. Within a few years, there were 16,000 miles of telegraph wires crisscrossing all over the country. And they even laid wires on the seabed of the Atlantic Ocean so you could talk to someone on the other side of the world. So that's how they solved the puzzle of how to send urgent messages over hundreds of miles... Without, without having, having to, to shout! shout. Well, it's Uncle Blodwin's birthday at the weekend and he loves balloons, so I'm wrapping up some balloons and sending to him in the post. What a nice idea. Have you seen this wrapping paper? It's got holograms on it. Oh, You've yeah. seen holograms before, haven't you? Look at that. That's a good one. You see, the trouble is with ordinary flat pictures is you only get, like, a two-dimensional image of the object, whereas with holograms, the images seem to leap out. It's almost as if you can reach in and grab them with your hands. Yeah, this one's of a microscope, and you can actually see right down the lens and see an insect at the bottom. But the best thing about holograms is that you can make them yourself at home. Believe me. Have a look at this. This is a self-portrait, right? A cartoon of my head. You can see the hair, the earring, the ears, the eyes. And look, there's that sticky up lip bit there. <laughs> First thing you'll need is a sheet of Perspex, Kate. There's one for you. Now, you can get uh, sheets like this from just about any DIY store. And you'll need a set of dividers, one for you, Kate. And the type to choose are the type with a bar across the middle, OK? You'll also need a drawing which you're going to turn into a hologram. There's one for you, Kate. Now, I've um, kept it simple on this occasion. A couple of uh, circles, one within the other. Now stick your drawing about halfway down the sheet of perspex, like so. Then spread your dividers until they reach to the centre of the area where you'd like your hologram to appear, which on this occasion is about there, I think. Yeah. And you make a small dot, OK? Go to any point on the circle, and then using the dividers, Holding them fairly flat like that, make a shallow groove along the perspex there. It's got to be very smooth, don't cut it too deep. When you've done that, move to another point on that circle and make another groove. And just keep going right the way around the circle until you're back where you started. To save time, here's one that I've scraped earlier. To give the hologram its depth, this is what you do. Take your drawing off and move it up. Not very far, just... Uh, a few millimetres or so, 
And then, because the distance between the centre of the bottom drawing and where the hologram is going to be has changed, you'll need to recalibrate your dividers. So once again, dividers in the centre of your drawing, then find that dot that you drew before, mark that position and adjust your dividers. Then do the same thing again with the other circle. Does it only work with circles then? Actually, no, it does work with just about any drawing you care to do. But the more complicated the drawing, the longer it will take to do. So uh, when you're finished, I've got time to do it right now, you should have something which looks like this. Let me just show you. You take off the original drawing and lo and behold, a homemade hologram appearing there somewhere. A homemade hologram. Isn't that good? But it's not actually finished yet because you really want to make the thing look even more impressive. And the best way to do that is to put it in some kind of frame and uh, black off the area which doesn't have the hologram on, put tape around the outside, and now that's what I call a homemade hologram. Here on The Big Bang, we believe that if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing big. So, at enormous expense, we've seriously gotten into feathers, lead and melons. Which falls to the ground fastest? A single feather or a ton of lead? Well, amazingly, they both fall at the same speed. A lump of lead and a bag of feathers. Now, we're going to prove that the weight doesn't actually matter. Now, this bag of feathers weighs about half a kilogram. And this lump of lead weighs rather a lot more at about two kilograms. Now, it is true that if we drop the feathers loose, they would fall slower. But that's nothing to do with weight. That's because they're fluffy and fluffy feathers float. But this bag will contain all the feathers in a nice, tight, aerodynamic lump so they don't float. So, in theory, they should fall at the same speed as this lump of lead. Right, here we go. A very heavy lump of lead and a light lump of feathers. Gareth, are you ready? Ready. Three, two, one. Gravity pulls harder on heavier things, so you might expect the lead to fall faster than the light bag of feathers. But you need more force to get heavy things like lead moving. So they hit the ground together. And finally, which would you rather have land on your head? A big lump of lead? Or a big lump of feathers? This carefully controlled experiment will give us the vital answer. Right then, Gareth. I'm thinking squash melons, Kate. I think I'd better stand clear. A melon massacre. Now for the feathers. Much less damage from the feathers. When the lead hits the melons, it stays in one piece and smashes straight through the fruit. But when the bag of feathers hits the melons, all the feathers inside are flung around. And energy that's taken up in feather flinging isn't available for melon crushing. So few, f fewer flattened melons. F -f Fantastic, home. <laughs> Well, that's about it. Just time for Gareth to do his egg trick. Ah, yes, yes. The, uh, the challenge was to remove the shell from an uncooked raw egg without damaging the yolk inside. Have a look at that, Kate. Ah, uh, that is really weird. It's gone all soft and squidgy and the shell's gone. Uh-huh. It's because it has been dissolved with vinegar. You see, vinegar, apart from being uh, really good on your chips, is actually an acid. An acid will dissolve calcium carbonate, which is what eggshells are made out of. So if you leave your egg in the vinegar, the acid if you like, overnight, you end up with these things. <laughs> Soft, squidgy, transparent eggs with no shells, completely dissolved. And it's not just eggshells which react with uh, vinegar. Anything with calcium in it, even bones, will be turned from hard to squidgy. Uh, now that is truly strange. That's all for today. We'll be back next time with some more strange goings on. I think Goodbye. I should break this over your head. Bye bye. Uh, no! Were you happy? Come on! Come on! <laughs>